everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get started with today's content, a few quick housekeeping notes. Please note that this presentation has been recorded and is for informational purposes only. You should consult a professional advisor for specific medical, legal, financial, or other advice. Please take a moment to carefully review the notice on the screen. This webinar is part of the AMA's Private Practice Sustainability Initiative. Private practice is an attractive option for physicians seeking the freedom and independence to practice in a setting that allows them to provide personalized medical care for their patients and is inclusive of practice owners, employed physicians, and independent contractors. Private practice is an important part of the healthcare delivery landscape, but has been under intense pressure for several years. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing concerns of, pre of physician practice owners, but has also created opportunities to change and improve healthcare delivery to patients. The AMA currently has a private practice sustainability toolkit live on their website, which aggregates a number of the AMA's existing resources intended to support private practices. It will be updated with new content throughout the remainder of the year, and you can visit this page to learn what resources are available to you. Finally, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Joining us today, we have Ross Burris and Sean Timmons from the Polsonelli Law Firm, and they will lead us through the content that we have prepared for you today. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Sean Timmons. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Timmons. I'm a shareholder in the Raleigh office of the Polsonelli Law Firm. Uh, I have been representing uh, physician practices and other healthcare providers for uh, over 20 years, uh, including uh, representing physician practices through the whole life cycle uh, formation, uh, developing compensation plans, and importantly for today's topic, uh, working through uh, payer audits, including both uh, Medicare audits and uh, commercial payer audits. Um, I have with me uh, my fellow shareholder, Ross Burris, who is in our Atlanta office, office uh, and uh, he has been working for many years uh, on uh, uh, a focused practice involving uh, payer audits and disputes, um, both uh, federal payers and commercial payers. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So this morning, we're going to walk through uh, some trends that we are seeing uh, both in Medicare reimbursement audits and in commercial payer audits. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking through some what we hope are practical tips on responding to audit requests and addressing appeals. Uh, and then a little time at the end talking about uh, payers' use of uh, cross-plan offsetting um, to try to put uh, more pressure on, uh, on physician practices and other providers. And so with that, I will uh, introduce my colleague, Ross Burris, to kick us off with Medicare reimbursement audits. Thanks, Sean. Uh, it's, it's a nice day here in Atlanta. We have the Atlanta Braves uh, World Series Champion Parade going to go under this window here or near this window here in a, in a couple hours. I wish y'all could see it. Um, as Sean mentioned, I am uh, my practice is primarily focused on reimbursement audits and pair disputes. I'm one of the leaders at that group here at the firm, uh, and I work on all variety of Medicare, Medicaid, commercial disputes, and even the occasional dispute with the Department of Justice related to uh, reimbursement questions on payment. So uh, <clears throat> this is not intended to be a, a full reimbursement recap or anything like that. Just thought it'd be interesting. I'm going to presume most of the practice folks out there are, are relatively familiar with the, with the tricks and traps of, of getting reimbursed and, and more importantly, keeping your money. Uh, but we are going to walk through a few of the trends we've been seeing in the past couple of years that might be uh, good for you to be aware of if you've not seen them yet and just to have uh, and on the know that they could be on the horizon for you. So uh, first up, let's talk about the TPEs. Uh, this stands for tar Target Probe and Educate, and we are seeing these a lot, especially for physicians. So these are a program that's designed to help providers and suppliers reduce claim denials and appeals through one-on-one -on -one help. It sounds really nice, right? But it's a huge pain. Uh, you get um, 
So every time, well, for a time you will be submitting claims, uh, CMS, somebody from the local Mac will come and they will ask you for lots of documentation on it. And you will go through several rounds of payment discussions. So they'll look at your records, they'll decide whether you should be paid or not. Um, and it's a very onerous process in that it's, it takes a lot of time to prepare these documents. Sometimes it takes a lot of conversations with the Mac. Um, it starts, I guess, from a good place, but these issues can also, um, as you go through the rounds of, of education, can also result in larger audits. So if you're not doing well on your various rounds of audits, you might expect even more questions, even more document requests, and ultimately more denials. So uh, the TPE can be beneficial. I've had some clients walk out of them and find them to be relatively, relative is the word, uh, helpful, but um, they're also quite onerous to deal with. And I would advise you, and Sean and I are gonna talk a little bit about this later on our audit response strategies, but I would advise you to take them very seriously. Uh, this isn't something you wanna just, you know, throw some documents in a box or throw them in a, in a zip file or upload them to the portal. Uh, you know, you don't wanna put your, uh, you know, lowest, you know, youngest person in the company or in the practice uh, on the on the calls, you want to you want to use your top folks who can really explain uh, the claims and really explain the medical necessity behind them. Next slide. Uh, yeah, recent tactics is, uh, oh, this is fun. So uh, when you're doing these things, do keep in mind uh, things like uh, they may add new issues per request. So they, you know, they may start out asking you about one issue and then as things going on, they add different, they add new codes, they add new um, documentation they're looking for, may turn to different types of procedures uh, and things like that. As the so, if the denials are limited to a single issue, um, they may be expanded to multiple issues. So, you know, you may look at it at first and say, ah, they're only asking about this one code. We can answer that really easily. This isn't going to be a big deal. Uh, but unfortunately, they do have a tendency to expand. Um, Second bullet there, years of dormancy, seeing significant uptick in volumes of requests. Yes, uh, we have seen these things take forever. Uh, you know, a lot of audits, you know, are done within three, four, five, six months. I've seen these things take almost two years. They just take a long, long time. One of the problems we have too is for physicians, especially a lot of times they send them directly to the physician. They don't always necessarily send them to the um you know, the practice manager or the main shareholder or something like that, all the practice, they're going out to all the individual physicians. And so we've had issues before where individual physicians got it, didn't quite understand it because they're not used to really talking to Medicare on, the, on their own and they got ignored or they got mishandled and things like that. So this is one of those things I always like to talk about in this context so you can educate everyone on the possibility of these audits and what to do if they do come in the door. I, I handled one last year with Palmetto where, you know, the, the, the audit itself ended up fine. In fact, it turned out the client was, uh, had an opportunity to get even better reimbursement for the way they were doing certain practices, uh, which is a pretty rare discussion with, with the Mac to have them say that. But they, um, you know, it initially got really sideways because individual physicians were getting the notices. They didn't quite understand. They were kind of all over the, the area and they got this and they thought somebody else was handling. And, and so they got really sideways with the Mac and it took us several months of conversation with them to show that we were taking the audit seriously and that we were gonna be focused on it. They started out very angry with us. So, um, you know, make sure your, your team knows to look for these things and handle them appropriately as well. Oh, commercial payer audits. Okay, uh, this is something I think nobody likes to talk about. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, very unique issues that deal with, you know, Medicare in comparison to commercial, I always think seems a little easy in a way, even though it's there, you have some Byzantine regulations and things like that, but commercial payer audits are so often driven by contracts. And so many of these contracts are very, are, uh, are rarely updated. I mean, I, I had a case last year uh, out in Texas where I was looking at a, a contract that was signed when I was in junior high and I'm 45. Like I, <laughs> it was a long, long time ago. Uh, literally, literally was printed on like a dot matrix printer. It looked like somebody had torn the little like uh, side perforations out. I mean, it was old uh, and nobody had updated it for years. And so, you know, uh, some of these payer audits can be really, really tricky. So just because 
you know, you can't always respond to them the way you would that Medicare audit because you, you have different rules. You have different opportunities for denial. You have different opportunities for termination, uh, rate changes, things like that that are completely all over the place. And you really have to be concentrated on your contract. And if you don't know where that contract is, you need to find it because you'd be shocked how often the payers lose it too. Uh, we've also had a few fun cases where we had the contract and they didn't. And we were able to point out to them the error of their ways based on the actual contract, which they had somehow lost through the mix. So um, Sean, let's talk a little bit about some of these audits. So um, uh, <laughs> On the front end, we're seeing payer audits where they want itemized bill and medical records with the express purpose to audit the claim prior to making payment. This is really annoying. We're seeing this a lot for uh, different types of, uh, recently I've seen it for some ASC, uh, some physicians that own ASCs where they're coming in and they wanna know, uh, you know how much every little individual piece that they're putting into uh, um, implants and things like that cost. And they're, they're nickel and diming them on whether, oh, you know, you're paying, 50 bucks for that screw, you could have, you know, we'll only pay you 30 bucks for the screw. And we're like, well, that's not fair because we literally paid $50 for the screw. <laughs> we don't make money on the hardware. We make money on our, our medical procedure itself. So, uh, you know, it's, they, they're, we're seeing a lot more activity in that realm, especially from Blue Cross uh, here in Atlanta, at least, has is, is been very active on that piece. Um, they are, you know, we're seeing a lot of claims just held up. Um, we're seeing this for the, this happened to the hospitals too, but uh, they're putting people on prepay audit and they just sit there forever. And in fact, they were doing this at first during the pandemic, uh, during the early, you know, dark days of, you know, March, April, 2020, uh, when people were just worried if they're going to keep the lights on and they were putting a prepay audit. So people not for the few procedures they had going on or for the few visits they had going on for commercial payers, especially, you know, in, in, in the individual physician practices, they weren't getting paid because they were looking at records. And of course it was taking them forever because everybody was on skeleton crews or working from home and just weren't as efficient at first. So, um, you know, again, my advice on those things is always to take it very seriously early, try to respond, you know, as, as um, efficiently as possible um, and quickly as possible. Um, you also, um, another point on here is to know the difference between like a prepay audit and a legitimate payment terminate determination. That's kind of a fun, question. So sometimes you're on audit. And the, the reason this gets difficult is this, if you're just on prepay audit, sometimes your claim just gets held up in like this, this kind of um, purgatory of not being denied or approved. So if your claim is actually determined, you actually have a determination, it's either, either paid or not paid, then you can at least do something with it. You, if it's paid, obviously you can say, thank you very much. If it's underpaid um, or if it's denied, you have an ability to appeal. Um, the problem with the prepay audits that we're seeing quite a bit is that you just end up in this purgatory. So it, it involves a lot of engagement with the payers. Again, I've seen the Blue Cross loves these things right now. We keep seeing them over and over again. And, and it's really difficult sometimes to get their attention. And unfortunately, back to your contract issues, it, can, it depends on your contract. So you know, Dr. Timmons over there, he may have a he may have signed a contract that had really, really tight provisions on when everybody should be noticed of various disputes, whereas Dr. Burris uh, maybe didn't call his lawyer like he should have and has kind of squiggly uh, provisions where it's not clear. Is he supposed to deny? Is he supposed to appeal? Is he supposed to write a letter? Is he supposed to demand arbitration? It's, it gets hard. And, um, you know, one thing, too, I will say, and this is just kind of a side note of practice, is we see a shocking amount on these old contracts of addresses that aren't updated, both for us as, as practices and physicians, but also for payers. So, um, you know, we're sitting there, we're frustrated, we're, you know, not getting paid, we don't quite understand why. And even though our, our payer rep has no problem finding us, for some reason, we can't get in touch with them to discuss the issue. Uh, this has happened with, to me, it's happened to clients of mine recently on United issues. It's happened on Blue Cross issues. It happens all over the country. It's not something unique to Georgia or my practice, but it's amazing how often it does happen that you finally get that call from the lawyer or, or medical director and they say, oh, hey, uh, you know, I didn't even know you had a problem. I'm like, well, hey, you know, we've been uh, banging our head against the wall for six months trying to get somebody to just talk to us about this. And now we're already really mad and we've had to file arbitration. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just sort of a, another practice tip on keeping your contracts up to date. Um, I know sometimes there's a hesitancy to update them, especially if you're afraid they might change your rate and you like what you got so far. Uh, but, you know, that is one reason to 
uh, if you do have to update it or it is coming due, make sure those addresses are updated as well. The same goes for practices. We see a lot, especially on the Medicare side, where people fail to update their addresses, auditor comes calling, they don't get the notice, uh, and then the next thing you know, they've been revoked from Medicare because they ignored an audit request, which is one of their favorite reasons to revoke people these days. And I've seen it, um, especially if people are working with PRN. So you work for this group once or twice a few months ago and uh, or a couple of years ago now, and they've come back and audited it and they have the old address from where you're, you were working before or something like that. Uh, they don't always get it to these folks. So we, you know, I've seen that several times in recent history. It's a very sad situation because it's, it's not so much, it's not the, the physicians themselves who are trying to ignore uh, Medicare, but it's their previous associated group that's ignored them. So it's a, it's a tough situation. Um, Ross, I, I just wanted to touch on uh, prepay audits. Um, sure. the, the last time I dealt with one was several years ago, but and I'm curious to see if this has continued. One of the challenges with commercial payers and prepay audits is sometimes they will tell you um, that you have to get a certain percentage of your claims right for a certain period of time before they'll mm -hmm. take you off of prepay audit. Sometimes you don't get that information um, and you have to badger the payer um, to let you know what are they looking for? What, what is the standard going to be? Um, is that still true? And if it oh. is, I think, uh, I think that puts even more emphasis on your point earlier about engaging with the payers, finding somebody to talk to, uh, making sure yeah. you're staying on them about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they oftentimes still have a sort of uh, approval threshold. Uh, and sometimes it's not clear. You have to badger them for it. And sometimes they give you like a really, you know, vague answer, kind of like the old Supreme Court pornography case of, you know, well, we know it when we see it, you know. And so, um, but it, it's important to ask that question if it's not clear in your, in your audits. That's exactly right. Um, and just know too, that the last question is, can payers withhold payment for better to provide information needed to perform a prepay audit? Maybe, probably, uh, they can definitely do it on prepay. Um, but um, almost every contract would allow for that. Almost every payer plan I've ever seen would allow for them to hold it if you don't provide information um, prior to payment. Uh, some contracts may even allow for them to hold payment if you don't respond to postpay audits, uh, depending on how you set that thing up. So, because um, what happens if you don't respond, they just deny it, and then you get a demand and they can recoup. So um, keep that in mind. It is, uh, you need to take these things very seriously. Uh, what else do we have, Sean? Oh, terminations. Yes. Oh, I was telling this story yesterday. So, uh, you know, one of the things they are, we are also seeing a lot more of is termination and uh, meaning that they just terminate your contract. So, you know, we had a case last year where, or a couple years ago now, where a, uh, a client had a uh, pretty, pretty favorable rate already negotiated um, Aetna or Cigna uh, came in and decided that they uh, they want to amend the contract to change the rate. Client responded and said, "No, you can't. You know, it's not within the time frame you're allowed to do that. You can pound sand." And they said, "Fine, but it is within the time frame that I can terminate you." And so they did. Uh, and you know, they are just getting much more aggressive with. It. And then the client had to claw back from there, which is like, great. Now we're out of network. We're about to be. Uh, and now we have to claw back and negotiate this rate with you after all. I mean, it's a draconian tactic, but that you but you will see that from time to time. So, you know, my advice there would be if you're looking at an amendment or you're just looking at disputes, you need to understand, you know, what is sort of the nuclear option for both sides as well. Maybe you are okay with terminating, but um, but if you're not, um, then you need to know whether they can terminate you very easily. Some and, and again, it's it's hard to kind of I hate to talk in generalities on these things, but it is, it's so contract specific. Uh, you just have no idea what it may be for your group. Uh, but I, I recommend you, you familiarize yourself with your termination provisions, because if, um, especially if you're anticipating any kind of issue with that pair, because they can, um, they can definitely use that as, as sort of their nuclear option. Um, yeah, I've had that issue, uh, Ross, looking at some of the, the bullets you've got here, I, I have definitely had that issue in the context of an audit where uh, Blue Cross uh, made some findings uh, and uh, requested an overpayment, not even a huge in the, in the scope of the world we live in, um, not even a huge um, overpayment, it was less than six figures. Um, and the 
my client wanted to push back on it, as of course they would. Um, and uh, Blue Cross essentially at a meeting um, said, okay, we hear you, we understand it, we don't really agree with it, and we don't really care that much about the money. So if you're not willing to write us a check right now, we'll just terminate you from our plan. And that, mm -hmm. that was their negotiating. And now my client and I have a tough decision about can you afford to be out of network uh, with Blue Cross, which in North Carolina, which is where I am, um, is a non-starter for most medical practices. That's so, right. Um, to, to your point about understanding what the nuclear option is, negotiations are much harder if you are really dependent on the payer that is doing the audit. Um, and mm -hmm. that's where maintaining open lines of communication and, and um, trying to get them to listen to you becomes really, really important. Yeah. And I mean, likewise, I say, you know, it's important to know your worth to them. If you're one of, you know, literally hundreds of physicians in your area, uh, and your specialty, then you're going to have a much harder time. If you're the only doctor in town uh, and you're only a doctor for 50 miles, then maybe you got a little bit more leverage. So know your work. Um, you know, that, that also brings it because they, and, and I will say on that, because they will, they will absolutely know who you are and what you're up to and how much you're worth to them. Um, one thing I think is interesting too, that we've seen a lot more recently is the data mining. And so you used to see this a lot. If anybody ever has to deal with a UPIC or a ZPIC from Medicare, those are usually based on data mining or trends. Um, what we've seen now, and Blue Cross especially I've seen do this, is also doing their own form of data mining. And so then people get pulled up for audits, but worse, terminations, um, related to how, like procedures, for example. For example, I had a, um, a physician client who was performing a really unique kind of cutting edge procedure um, that he had gone to a lot of special training to learn uh, in a small town. And they frankly just didn't believe he could possibly be doing these procedures in this small town. You know, like who is this country bumpkin doing this really complicated procedure down there? And I was like, it was our guy. He trained all over the country. He, you know, heard about this. He had family that, that needed that kind of thing. And he kind of made it his personal mission to learn it. And he did a ton of education for himself on it and really kind of bettered it and was you know, proud to bring, you know, this service to his patients and to his community, and people loved him for it, except Blue Cross, <laughs> who suspected that, you know, it was unnecessary, or he wasn't really doing it right, or, or all these things, even though there was no accusation that that was the case. Um, and so, you know, unlike Medicare and a UPIC, who maybe just audits you and issues a demand, they just up and terminated him which, you know, Georgia is like North Carolina, you know, termination from Blue Cross for most people in for physicians in Georgia can be a death nail. So um, it was, it was very, it was hard for him. And uh, we had to get them back on, um, we had to, we had to convince him in that case that uh, his, not only was he very qualified, but the procedures were very necessary. And we did, we were able to do that, but uh, that was a, that was a, a, a difficult way to start the conversation already being terminated as opposed to doing it the backwards way. And like well, I said, it was Mm -hmm. and, and that's a key distinction, I think, between these commercial payer audits and the Medicare audits you were talking about earlier. And, and I have to say this to my clients all the time, that with a Medicare audit, sometimes the money looks scary, but um, they are much less likely to terminate you over overpayments as long as they don't represent fraud. Um, mm -hmm. And you have the, the regulatory framework for doing their audits and appeals is much better established. We really know where we are um, in a Medicare audit almost all the time. Whereas with commercial payer audits, I won't say that it's exactly the Wild West um, because departments of insurance do regulate them to a certain degree. But departments of insurance are not interested in protecting uh, physicians. They're interested in protecting beneficiaries. Um, and so sometimes, even if you go to a DOI, it's difficult to get their attention on this. And so what happens is, as Ross, as you were saying, you, you have uh, a, an insurance company with a lot more options about mm -hmm. what it can choose to do to, to put pressure uh, on you as a provider. Yeah, and, and I'll just say right now, because I get this question once every couple months, going to the Department of Insurance in all the states I've ever tried to do it 
does not work. And if, and if a lawyer or somebody consultant or somebody convinces you that they can go to the Department of Insurance for you and get everything turned around, I'd ask for a second opinion. I would just go out there and say that right now. It almost every single, it, you, it used to work. A few years ago, you could do it and a lot of departments of insurance would get involved. These days, not so much. Almost every single time, they will investigate, they will look into it, but it'll just make the payer mad. And uh, because now they're being investigated and they have to answer to it. And almost every time at the end of this investigation, they will say, that's a contract dispute, work it out and uh, walk away. Because like Sean said, unless you actually have proof that the beneficiaries are somehow being harmed, uh, which is hard. It isn't just that they're being deprived of my wonderful services because I'm an amazing doctor. It's It's got to be something pretty serious. Like, um, you know, they're not getting certain types of emergency care or things like that. Um, it, they're going to just tell you to work it out amongst yourself. So that's my my preach for the day. Uh, I have somebody ask me to do that at least every couple months, and I will do it for them every single time with, with that caveat I just gave you all for free. So, uh, you know, it, it, it almost never works and it usually just tends to make everybody matter um so and, and on that i mean my tip would still be um uh, you know talk to if you have a good provider rep if you've got a good contact at the at the payer if you you know your friend went to college with the you know ceo i mean i'd use that any day before i tried to turn them into the department of insurance because that just never seems to work um and all it does uh, is you cultivate relationships with the in-house lawyers at the insurance companies, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you actively work to make sure that you have good credibility with them for exactly That's right. Reason, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, it's how are you going to work things out with your neighbor? Are you going to call the police on them every day? Or are you going to go over there and tell them that, you know, they, you know, their sprinkler has been on too long or whatever. You're going to, you're going to have a better relationship with your neighbor if you just go by and tell them to turn off their sprinkler than you do if you call the cops on them every day. So I think that's how the plans look at it too, most of the time. Um, and, and as I mentioned a moment ago, and the last thing on the commercial um, audits is that, you know, a lot of these happen absolutely without warning. They don't even audit you first, or, or you get an audit and it looks so benign, you don't even realize what they're asking about. And next thing you know, you've been terminated. So oh, the police are starting to come in for the parade. You can hear the sirens behind me. Uh, what else do we have? I think we have some cross point offsetting. Yes, sir. This is a fun one too. So, you know, we've seen, um, so let me explain what this is. So cross plan offsetting is when, you know, these big insurance companies, you know, I joke, there's only really like four insurance companies left at this point, right? They've all merged and acquired each other so much that it's basically just, you know, Blue Cross and Humana and United, Cigna and Aetna, you know, just a handful and all those are tied to. Um, but one of the things that we've seen recently, if you want to go to the next slide, is they will, so oftentimes physicians, sometimes physicians make the decision to go out of network. And I've seen this a few times, some emergency physicians do it sometimes, um, certain types of surgeons will do it, or maybe it wasn't so much conscious, it's just a group that you don't service very often, so there's no need to have a contract with, okay? Um, everybody's gonna have some out of network issues, especially if you work in a hospital. Um, and so this is, it, it tends to happen more for the hospital-based physicians, but um, in any case, it's, it's weird enough and egregious enough that I think it's important for you to understand it because I did handle one of these cases with United uh, a couple of years ago for a hospital-based physician group that was very, very confused and very upset, but they weren't ultimately in the wrong. Um, so what happened was in these cases, and this is not my case that's cited here, by the way, this is somebody else's case, but we had a similar result. So uh, what happens in cross-plant offsetting is, let's say United, for example, has a number of products. Say they have their typical uh, sort of commercial product, and then they have a TRICARE product, for example. So if you are out of network on their TRICARE product, uh, but you still have some kind of dispute with them about it, and they decide you've been overpaid, what they're seeing, what you're seeing sometimes is that they'll just go ahead and offset you on the other plant. So, you know, I don't get much from you know, United TRICARE. I had one claim last year. It was a total mess. They denied me uh, or they, they paid me and then they demanded the money back. I'm still arguing with them on an appeal. Um, and rather than just, you know, holding that money or, or letting you keep the money until you've decided what to do with it, even though you're at a network with them, you can't typically recoup against somebody on a commercial plan if you're at a network. Uh, they'll go ahead and recoup from you on your other plan where you do have an agreement to recoup, which is just dastardly so you know suddenly you're like wait a minute 
uh, my fights with United Tricare, but I'm suddenly losing all this money on my claims for you know regular commercial United. And just so you know, recruitment, when I talk about that in this circumstance, recruitment is just the process by which they take money back. And it's usually or often in the form of offset. So meaning if, if you have a claim that's $100 that United is going to pay today, but they think you already owe them $50, and they'll take $50 off this claim and just pay you $50. Pretty, pretty easy concept. But they're not supposed to do it unless you have an agreement to do so. So not every agreement has an offset in it. Uh, not every plan, although most new ones do, old ones didn't, but new ones do. So if you have one of those contracts when I was in junior high, you, might, you may have lucked up there. But um, cu current agreements usually have that provision. You're not going to get out of it. Um, but so um, this particular group uh, appealed and they took it to court. And they said, no, what you're doing is wrong. And uh, we did not agree to be offset here. Uh, on this plan, we may have agreed on the other plan, but we didn't agree here. Uh, and you can't take money that we owe you on that other plan purportedly and take it from the payments on this plan. And uh, the court agreed. And it makes United so mad when you point this out to them. Uh, but we've had to do it several times because we actually see this issue quite a bit, especially for physicians. And I don't know what it is about physicians that it seems to happen more often to them, but we do see it, see it fairly often. So, um, you know, and, and Sean, you, you made a good point on that yesterday, if you want to repeat it, just about kind of understanding, again, your, your payments, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is where, uh, and, and I, would, I would speculate, uh, Ross, you're saying you don't know why physicians, uh, why it happens to physicians more than other providers. There are a lot of particularly smaller physician practices that aren't carefully reviewing um, their remittance advices or explanations of benefits. So mm -hmm. they might not notice. I mean, the, the, the stereotype sort of joke that we used to, to tell among ourselves 15 years ago, at a small practice physician sort of looks at the bottom line, doesn't try to understand what the, what the income statement is telling them and says, gosh, I didn't make as much money this, this month as I expected to. I guess I'll have to see more patients uh, next month. Sometimes it's going to be a practice like this, where a payer has, uh, has done an offset against one or more payments during the course of the month. And so um, to Ross's point, if you're not carefully reviewing or if you don't have somebody in your uh, billing department carefully re reviewing EOBs and cross or, or remittance advices and cross-checking them against the claims that have been sent, you can get caught by this and you can end up yeah. um, giving up a lot of money that you shouldn't have had to um, just because uh, not enough focus was paid to this. So um, I can't stress that enough uh, um, it, in terms of reconciling what you're receiving against what you claim um, for these practices and any other shenanigans that the payers might get up to. Yeah, and this, in this particular case is interesting because this was actually a third-party ministry administered plan for a self-funded plan. So that was even worse because it really wasn't their money. <laughs> they were literally just the, the manager essentially of, of the money. Um, so, Wait, yeah, so you, you mean, know, it's so not, the, I mean, the, Acting as a third party administrator, they withheld money from one of their insured plans for the benefit of one of their ERISA plans. Is that what happened? I think so. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a wild case. Um, yeah. You know, and, and to your point, you know, it, it is death by a thousand cuts. So, you know, it's $50 off this $100 claim here. It's, you know, $10 off this $50 claim there. You know, it's, it's by a thousand cuts, but that adds up. So, um, I mean, you, you certainly, deserve to be paid. So keep an eye on that. Um, that's a good, that's sort of the, the takeaway from this slide.